Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, a discussion about sports and activism and sports as a space where the fight for racial justice has unfolded and continues to unfold. My name is Marcia Eli. I am the Director of Programs at the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History, and I'm part of the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents the team that brings you series and experiences like Lit Film, Cinema Ephemera, University Open Air, Night of Philosophy and Ideas, Music on the Plaza, and much more. And if any of those piques your interest, I hope you'll visit the BPL Presents page on the library's website. We will share a link to that at the end of the program. So tonight I am really thrilled to welcome Dave Zirin, author of the new book, The Kaepernick Effect, and his conversation partner, Khalil Green, a Gen Z historian in essence, with a half million social media followers. These two have much to share and I'm eager to introduce them. But first I wanna say a word about the book and the athletes it gives space to. So many of us remember the quiet and at the same time explosive action Colin Kaepernick took five years ago. We've witnessed the mass political movement that's taken shape since then. And we've thought about the courage that standing up as an athlete takes and the stakes at play. This book reflects on all of that. It's about the politics of sports and the impact of sports on politics. And it's about the players across generations and levels who inspire by using the platform of their field or court to fight police brutality and justice and racism. The program tonight is part of a series of discussions connected to the Center for Brooklyn History's initiative, Brooklyn Resists, which digs deeply into the history of Black-led protests. You can learn more about Brooklyn Resists and all of its many facets by going to the link in the chat. I suspect that listening to Dave and Khalil will prompt many of you to want to explore Dave's book further. So we will also put a link in the chat to the website of a local Brooklyn bookstore, the community bookstore. So you can, with a click, learn more about the Kaepernick effect. A few final notes, and then I happily hand it off. As with all Center for Brooklyn History programs, we, you have the option to engage uh, closed captioning tonight. You can simply click that at the bottom of your screen. And finally, you're all invited to share your questions. For Dave and Khalil, type them throughout the program into the Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen. All right, now let me briefly introduce Dave and Khalil and invite them while well, they have stepped out from behind that digital curtain and hand it off to them. Briefly, because I could go on, but um, I'm not. Dave Zirin is the sports editor of The Nation, a columnist for The Progressive, and the host of the Edge of Sports podcast. His many books include A People's History of Sports in the United States, Game Over, Bad Sports, and as you know, The Kaepernick Effect, most recently. Dave has been a regular guest on MSNBC, CNN, and ESPN. He was also named one of Utney's Reader's is that what me reader? He was elected the first black student body president in Yale's 318 year history. He is currently finishing his studies of social movements and history. He has approximately a half a million followers across his TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn platforms where he comments about forgotten history and our society. He has worked with ESPN sports, uh, sports and pop culture website, The Undefeated, and authored op-eds about racial equity in the New York Times, Washington Post, among others. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. And I, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Dave, how are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. I have such warm feelings for Brooklyn, for the society, for Ms. Eli. So th this is just everything to me. And I'm very grateful to you for making the time to do this. Of course. No, same shout out to Brooklyn. I'm from Maryland, but my mom's from Bed-Stuy. 
um, she was born and raised here. So it's a, it's a great sort of return to, uh, um, to where she's from. But I, I think if you want to get started, we could jump right into the questions, if that sounds good to you. It does, except I live in Maryland now. Where did you uh, grow up? Oh, really? I'm uh, Montgomery County. Yeah, that's where I am right now. Germantown. I'm from Germ I was born and raised in Germantown, Maryland. I'm sitting here in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Wow. Wow. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's amazing. Not not to like take it away from New York. We know we love New York, um, but yes. shout out to Maryland too. Shout out to Maryland. Of course. So how about we jump into it? Um, I think the first question on the audience's mind, and I guess mine before I started reading the book, though it's answered early on, but I'd love to hear in your own words, what is the Kaepernick effect? Ooh, the Kaepernick effect is the chain reaction that took place after Colin Kaepernick first sat during the anthem and then took a knee in August and September of 2016. But I think the best way to describe the effect is to say something about how I even like came up with this idea that I wanted to spend a big chunk of my life working on this book and talking to people and interviewing them and whatnot. Like it started when I was talking to 1968 Olympian John Carlos, who so famously raised his fist on the medal stand in Mexico City. And John, a couple of years ago, looked at me and he just said, you know, Dave, after I raised my fist in Mexico City, a ton of young people started doing it at track meets around the country. And I was like, what? You know, like I, I always considered myself a bit of an amateur historian. So I was like, where, where are these people? Who are they? How did it affect their lives? How did it affect their coaches? I was really curious to know how, the effect of John Carlos's fist. And I realized that that was gonna be an impossible task. Uh, so I started to then think about all of the one-off stories that I'd read and some of which I'd written about young people who took a knee after Colin Kaepernick. So you, there'd be a one-off story about one uh, young woman who was kicked off the team for taking a knee, one young man who was uh, disciplined by his coach, uh, a team in Detroit that had garbage thrown at them, like all like these stories that, that I'd written or that I'd read. I started to think, you know what, this is very significant. You know, if, if I mean, I write about the intersection of sports and politics. And if hundreds, if not thousands of young athletes in this country took a knee after Colin Kaepernick, we need to tell that story. So I started the process of at the start of the pandemic of calling a lot of folks who were roughly around your age. And this is one of the pluses of it being at the start of the pandemic is I know, you know, this Khalil, like sometimes it's tough to get uh, folks on the phone, you know, and actually have a conversation with them. You know, they want to text, they want to Snapchat. They just, it's, do people still Snapchat? I don't know, but, but it's okay. But, but it's so because of the pandemic, people were at home, they were a little bit bored and they were happy to talk to me. So I started having these long conversations with young people who'd taken a knee, learning about how it affected their lives. And that's where my head was. I was just like, I'm going to save this history from being forgotten. But then summer of 2020 happens, the police murder of George Floyd, you have the largest protests in the history of the United States in the summer of 2020. And I went back and I called the dozens of people I'd interviewed up to that point. And it was amazing to me that, that all of them were either in the streets or organizing people to get in the streets. And that really made me realize that while many roads may have led us to the summer of 2020, one of them runs straight through the athletic fields of the United States. And that story is worth telling. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think reading the book, you definitely get a sense of that because it really is a collection of stories um, and of the impact, like of, of stories of the impact um, that Colin Kaepernick had on these individuals, but also the impact that they had on their own communities um, with various, all, all sorts of reactions I think you see throughout the book. Um, and one question that I have uh, to kind of follow up from that is, in the book, uh, it's pretty much separated into three main parts, looking at high school protests, college protests, and professional protests that followed Colin Kaepernick's. Um, and I'm wondering, like, why did you choose to segment it in that regard generationally, as opposed to maybe like mm. um, the South or bad reactions mm. and good reactions? Like, what was that thought process like? That's a great question. And it was like a, a lot of thought went into, okay, how am I actually gonna organize all of these stories that I'm getting as sort of a catch as catch all is, because once the word got out, I was doing this book, people started reaching out to me saying, well, my cousin took a knee, you know, I, can you talk to them? And, and so there, there was all of this like swirling around, like how should I properly organize this? And one of the things I saw early on, like my first thought actually was exactly what you said, like, should I do this by region? Should I go, blue state, red state, should I go rural, urban? And then I realized that like so many of the stories, 
it, it actually transcended that, you know, or, or you could say maybe transcend isn't even the right word, but, but the, the, the connective tissue between the stories to me was so strong that it belied whether you were in a red state or a blue state or anything like that. And frankly, I think some of those differentiations are, you know, are, are mainstream media nonsense, you know, because everyone knows that each of these red state, blue state, it can be very diverse. You know, I mean, after George Floyd was murdered, there were protests in all 50 states in the United States. And similarly, like some of the reactions in, you know, nice cities that are thought of as liberal and whatnot, like Seattle, could be more vicious towards people taking a knee than say someone doing it in a rural community in Georgia. Like it depended on so many factors in terms of the backlash that young people would receive. So I, I went high school, college and pro because I really started thinking, you know, th there are very distinct and specific challenges that a high school student would face, a college athlete on scholarship would face, and then a professional athlete, like three different, very distinct realms. Because in high school, we all know what it is. We all remember what it was like to be in high school. You know, you're stepping out. You know, you're making yourself heard. There, there's a lot of courage that goes along with that. No one, with very rare exceptions, necessarily wants to stand out in high school or stand against the grain. And I wanted to honor that specific kind of courage for people who have been born, you know, after 9-11 and have really known nothing in this country other than a permanent kind of state of war and you know and, and of course the pandemic environmental catastrophe i mean i have a 17 year old daughter so people who've been raised under this very specific set of circumstances i wanted to honor that uh, at the collegiate level you're dealing with scholarships you're dealing with a coach who could cut you off the team scholarships at a lot of schools are only renewed on an annual basis even at schools without scholarships a lot of pressure can be applied to your financial aid to all, all sorts of factors relative to playing sports so i had to honor that kind of very specific set of challenges and then at the professional level i mean we're talking paychecks you know we're talking uh collusion against you if you dare speak out you know another very specific set of challenges the kind of challenges that really hit Colin Kaepernick right in the face after he took his knee so I wanted to very specifically honor and extrapolate off those very very different set of generational circumstances yeah and I yeah. think and I that makes a lot of sense and even as I'm reading the book um you start to see kind of other ways of categorizing and thinking about separating the things that you kind of weave throughout the high school college and pro categorization really well um and one of those other sort of categorizations that i think was was standing out to me as i read it was the fact that not everyone who protested was playing the same sport right like colin kaepernick is a football player um and a lot of the examples like right off the bat are football players um that look to him as inspiration especially black other black males um but as you go throughout the book you see like black women in college at ivy leagues who are cheerleaders also taking the stance that Colin Kaepernick did or people doing different um, forms of resistance. So whether it's a knee or sitting down or putting the fist up, um, I'm really curious, maybe investigating, let's say like the sports and the, the gender aspect, like what are some of the trends that you saw dependent on whether or not someone was like a football player or a cheerleader or mm -hmm. um, one of the, like the questions that we'll get to later says like WNBA, how a lot mm -hmm. of people look after that. Well, wow, and another another great question, Khalil. This is, uh, and folks should know that I, I don't know what these questions are, so I'm just responding off the top of the dome to some very, very serious set of inquiries here. So let, let me try to take that on uh, in terms of the different sports and whatnot. Well, the one I'm using the word honor a lot, partly because I have so much respect for the people that I interviewed and I feel like a, a sense of, of, of real connection with them at this point. Um, you know, after having called them, recalled them during the protests of 2020, just that the, there's a, a, a set of re really just like tight, a tightness there, you know, that, that, I, that has enriched my life tremendously. It's made me far more optimistic than I was when I started this book, honestly, about the future, just talking to these folks. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was honor the breadth of the experience that existed, because if I made a book just about football players, that would be in effect a historical lie because I would be saying, here's the effect. It involves men, it involves young, young men, it involves football. And it's not just a football story. It's spread to so many different sports. I had to make a real point to honor the contribution of women. I mean, because women so often get, particularly black women get written out of the history books. And this is a case where like with the Black Lives Matter movement, in many cases, black women are the backbone of this Kaepernick effect, of this struggle, of pushing it forward. 
Um, and we could talk about the WNBA preceding Colin Kaepernick taking that knee. So just to give another layer to the, the role that women have played in this struggle. And one of the things that um, I found, though, to get to your question is I, I found that, you know, there are stereotypes aren't very helpful is what I found. Like, like people might think, well, I bet a high school women's softball team would be more supportive than a men's football team or something like that, you know, because there would be more of a culture of, of, of community in, in women's sports than men's sports. I found doing this book that when we're talking about racial inequity and police violence and people don't want to hear that, the figurative knives come out. You know, if people don't want to hear what you have to say in this country, the response can be very brutal. And one of the common threads in the book is really this specter of violence as a response to what is a nonviolent uh, act of civil disobedience. And to me, that's a stunning window onto this country even larger. Like it doesn't matter if you're a, a softball player in one part of the country or a youth football player in Beaumont, Texas. It's like if you're if you are challenging the status quo, if you are challenging the way white supremacy works in this country, then people aren't going to just agree to disagree or people aren't going to say, hmm, you're making a good point. Maybe I should at least listen to you and hear you out. In some cases, people do say that. And you, there are stories of people who are actually changed through these protests. But in other cases, the response is not only do I not want to hear what you have to say, but I am going to respond violently to that. And I feel like this, what all these young athletes went through in, in, from 2016 to 2020 was kind of like the canary in the coal mine, you know, the warning of everything we're seeing right now with regards to so-called critical race theory and the idea of teaching about structural racism in schools. I mean, we, we got such a sneak preview around these kneeling protests of how a certain segment of this population will respond if you dare raise up these flags against structural racism. Yeah, and I think um, it reminds me of, well, I'm a student, as you know, I, I'm a history major, specifically studying the history of, of social change and social movements. Yep, love history. Uh, and, and like one of the most basic stories or the most, I guess, profound and, and well-known stories of um, nonviolent protests comes from the civil rights era and MLK. And a lot of what you'll find is that they use nonviolence knowing specifically that it would cause a violent reaction from the white Southerners or whatever mm -hmm. um, audience was there. And that that, that violent attack on nonviolent people um, would be a spectacle enough to get other people outside of their community on their side. So in a lot of ways, it's like almost making yourself a martyr um, in, a, in a small way, um, mm -hmm. in a lot of these cases in their own community to, to make a larger statement about the fact that like, wow, like all I'm doing is kneeling or raising a fist, yet it's causing this reaction. So like, what else do we need to look at? Um, mm -hmm. And then as you say, over time, um, like the, the, we find that nonviolent protests can turn into um, other forms of protest, especially after something like George Floyd, where mm -hmm. a lot of communities, like the, there was a straw that broke the camel's back. And mm -hmm. after so many years, you say like the, the canary, um, the canary song and, and just like the warnings after so many years, like it's, if it still doesn't work, um, you see what we have, like what we had last summer with like the racial justice uprising riots, um, which I think it, it's a very, it's a very interesting um, sort of dynamic and cycle of nonviolent to like increasing frustration in communities of color against what's happening. Uh, I'm curious from from the oh, interview before you asked that question. Yeah, of course, go ahead. You just said you because uh, you just said some stuff. I'd love to respond oh, of course, to. React to it. Made some amazing points. <laughs> um, on on, on th I'll, I got three bullet points in my brain based on what mm -hmm. you said. The first is you know I just came back from Minneapolis today, and you go to uh, George Floyd Square, and one of the murals that's there is this huge mural of Colin Kaepernick taking a, a knee. And, and, and it's, it, it's chilling and very moving because implicit in presenting that over uh, where George Floyd's body lay is this idea of, okay, we tried expressing this in the most peaceful possible terms that there's a problem with police violence in this country and racism, and that was ignored or it was responded to with hostility and violence. And you, know, if you, you, have, to, you have to listen to people when they're stepping forward with their concerns in our society or you know you're going to reap the whirlwind at some point 
the the civil right you also mentioned the civil rights movement and two quick things about that quick parallels to this Kaepernick effect movement that we've seen over the last five years the first is what anybody who's watched eyes on the prize knows the part of all the civil rights activists who speak about uh the fact that uh emmett till the the brutalizing the lynching of emmett till in mississippi um was something that changed their lives and it was like a scar that that just could not be erased and it informed that they needed to be part of the struggle going forward no matter what i found in talking to a lot of these young people that trayvon martin was really the emmett till of this generation and that was that was very moving and surprising to me that every single person i spoke to practically they said the name trayvon martin more than they said the name colin kaepernick when speaking about what informed their protest and it really made me think about the fact that wow like trayvon martin he was killed in 2012 that's nine years ago so if you're 20 that means that happened when you were 11 and if you're 11 you know you're old enough to get what's happening but also young enough to ask the question, why does the world have to be this way? And that, that really, I think, stuck with people in a big way. The other civil rights movement parallel that, that comes to mind is when you think of something like the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, this, this was an issue about respect and about Jim Crow on the bus lines. You know, that's what people were fighting around. But the, the, the powers that be in Montgomery, not to mention the powers that be throughout the Jim Crow South, saw it as some a much bigger threat like whoa if they're talking about bus lines today who knows what they'll be talking about tomorrow this is like pulling the string on a sweater and i think that's very similar to uh to colin kaepernick and all these young people who took a knee like yes they were doing it um for racial equity yes they were doing it against police violence but i think one of the reasons why the reaction was so was so like incredibly vicious in some cases was because implicit in taking that knee is a statement, especially that it's being done during the anthem, that there is a gap between what this country says it represents and then the lived experiences of so many people in this country. And that is a very intense challenge to put towards power uh, in the United States. Yeah, no, that really resonates with me. I think I was, I know I was in eighth grade. I'm not sure how old I was like in terms of the number um, when the Trayvon Martin case was was like publicized and came to light and even before then I think I actually had heard of Emmett Till and he like I just remember hearing this um from my parents at some point and I think that was in the 50s and my grandmother was born in the 40s I think she's older than Emmett or older than Emmett Till would have been so I always like had that in the back of my mind Mm -hmm. and just seeing like the modern day like modern day lynchings right like they're similar in kind different in like the realities I guess but just seeing how like a lot of those things are replicated today is just very jarring. Um, and I think right after Trayvon Martin, I want to say like it was like successions of of killings like over the years. It was um, Tamir Rice was soon after that, and then Mike Brown and Freddie Gray. That one was in Baltimore in 2015. I remember that one the most because it was in Maryland. Um, there were a lot more protests around that. Um, and then Sandra Bland and Philando Castile and like all of these Eric Garner. Like a lot of the cases that just happened in this like really short stock time span. And I think just like, it was just so frustrating and, and really heartbreaking. Um, and I think that that does shape a generation. I think there was a poll that I saw that right behind the pandemic. So it was number one before the pandemic, but like the event or like the cause that shapes our generation um, was the Black Lives Matter movement. Whether or not it was positive or negative reactions, like it was the thing that shaped Gen Z the most, which is, is really in, like kind of interesting and, and kind of crazy to see, but also, it makes a lot of sense, especially seeing like the impact of the civil rights movement back in the day. It was probably one of the largest things that was on people's minds as a domestic issue in the 60s. Definitely. Um, and and I'm, I'm really appreciative of you mentioning those cases and the way they shape people, because you know, social media is also very much a part of this story, you know, because when people see the video, especially in the summer of 2016, when Alton Sterling, Terrence Crutcher, uh, Philando Castile, all killed, and the videos going viral and people seeing them. And then the response by so many people in power and in politics are saying, well, the problem is social media. And it's like, no, the problem is police violence. It's like when people say to me that Colin Kaepernick is polarizing and taking a knee is polarizing. I'm just, in my head is like, no, what's polarizing is police violence. What's polarizing is racism. That's what it's polarizing. Mm -hmm. And when we even talk about polarization, 
we have to keep in mind that if you drill into the polls about people taking a knee, particularly Colin Kaepernick, it's not so much that America is polarized, it's white America that's polarized because uh, black and brown folks broadly support the right to protest during the anthem, particularly around issues of racial inequity. It's broadly supported, but it is among white people, particularly like white families sometimes, of people who disagree, like some who say, yes, this is appropriate, we have to do something, and others who are absolutely repulsed at the mere thought of anybody protesting either at a sporting event or during the anthem. But that's the power of taking that knee, though. It is so ubiquitous. I mean, if Khalil, if, if you and I took a knee like at the Maryland State Fair, or if we took a knee at a Ravens game, or if we took a knee at the Super Bowl every, during the anthem, everybody would immediately know why we were taking that knee. I mean, I think that's the power of it is that, you know, people see it and they know that you're issuing a kind of direct challenge at the status quo. And I think that's really one of the things that drove the people who didn't want to see it off the deep end. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned taking a knee and like how everyone would understand. And I think especially after last year, you saw a lot of like symbolic gestures, in my opinion, everyone has their own, but of like there be the Dem Senate Democrats um, in the Kente cloth taking a knee um, or someone did very recently, some CEO, I can't remember who, um, but they just took a knee like in support of black lives or something that happened, or I think maybe in support of what was happening at the border with the Haitian migrants, like just taking a knee is like a racial justice protest. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about like, well, how, like how, how has the taking of a knee been mm -hmm. diluted over time? And in what ways has that symbolism been beneficial, but then also like you've seen it in negative places. I think there was a part of the book where you kind of just like um, a highlight or maybe it was in the forward highlight, like how taking a knee is also the, the stance that killed George Floyd in a lot of ways. So like, yes. what, what is the different meanings of the symbolism however many years after Colin Kaepernick did it? Well, first and foremost, uh, the, the power of that juxtaposition. I saw that at protests that I went to th throughout the summer of 2020 of, you know, it didn't take an American studies degree from Columbia for people to realize that this is really like a tale of two knees. Basically, you have Colin Kaepernick's knee, which is a nonviolent expression of the desire for social change, and then Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck of George Floyd. And the these two knees say so much about where we are as a country and about what we view as acceptable and not acceptable. I mean, there are people who still defend Officer Chauvin's murder of George Floyd and excoriate Colin Kaepernick for taking that knee. And that to me is like a funhouse mirror of morality. You know, so th there is this differentiated realities in this country in terms of what we see as acceptable, you know, as part of human life. And that, that's something that we need to actually drill down on and discuss. Uh, the other thing you're asking about, though, which is so important, is this idea of appropriation and watering it down. I mean, that's a feature of this country. I mean, th there's a Malcolm X postage stamp, for goodness sakes. And, uh, you know, I remember when, God, I'm going to sound old, but when Public Enemy and Chuck D said in 1989, uh, you know, most of my heroes don't appear on those stamps. And, you know, and that was in 1989, that was a true statement. But, you know, our our icons of, of, of radicalism, our icons of people who are fighting for direct change, uh, they get appropriated because they can't be destroyed or forgotten. Like you can't make this country forget about Malcolm X. You can't make young people uh, forget about that history or Tommy Smith and John Carlos. So what you do instead is you appropriate it and sell it back to people as something consumable, something to sell. You know, anything to make it safe, anything to extract its political canines so they don't bite at a system that's treating people unfairly. And I think with the knee, there's been that effort at what, as well. Uh, I think Nancy Pelosi and the Kente cloth is something that uh, is worth <laughs> dwelling upon a little bit. Um, but the, the, the one thing though that, that I see is that when it comes to the knee, context is everything. I just got um, an email last week about a high school where uh, the football team took a knee and people in the stands took a knee because of both racist and homophobic Snapchats that uh, were going around the school. And so this was a, and so it was Black Lives Matter flags alongside um, LGBTQ flags um, in, in the stands, people holding them up high, taking a knee. 
you know, in a situation like that, that's still, that's really powerful, you know, and that, that's a, a tremendous statement of anti-oppression in a very challenging set of circumstances, a high school football game. You know, much to the chagrin of the administration and of, of parents and all of this. And so, so that's the, the power is still there if exercised in a way that, that brings with it risk. I mean, there, there was no risk in Nancy Pelosi taking a knee while wearing a kente cloth. There's, there's no risk when it's a team activity, for example, because the franchise ownership group wants to market the team as being some sort of anti-racist entity because they want to appeal to Generation Z or something like that you know, and get those, get those dollars, you know, that that's a very different circumstance than people actually risking something. And I wish this wasn't the case, but one of the things that gives protest its power is risk and the way in which we intuit that risk when we observe it from a distance. Yeah. And you mentioned that like interesting case you said of the pride flag and the black lives matter flag being flown together. Um, and there's so many diverse, like you said, contexts and and stories around when people took a knee or did something similar in athletic protests. And I'm wondering out of all the interviews that you had, which one is like the most memorable, the most stand out to you and why? Wow, um, on one level, thinking of which interview uh, hits me the most in my heart is like, oh my goodness, like, like choosing uh, between favorites because I, I treasure all these relationships so much. But the, the one I, I carry with me uh, is the case of Rodney Axon Jr. because th there's so much pathos in what he went through. This is a football player uh, in Brunswick, Ohio, which is a suburb outside of Cleveland. And the pathos is that his family moves from a rough neighborhood in Cleveland to this suburb in Brunswick precisely so it's safer and he gets a better public school education. So his parents are trying to do things the quote unquote right way from the standpoint of what we're taught is the American dream. You know, you get you get out, you move up, all that stuff. And yet here's Rodney Axon Jr. and he's in a community where he faces open racism, where he faces harassment from the police, where he's on the football team and uh, he hears all sorts of racial epithets thrown around all the time at other people. And when he says, hey, I find that offensive, his teammates look at him like he's, you know, half off the beam saying, well, what, what are you talking about? We're not talking about you. Basically saying you're, you're one of the good ones. You're our teammate. It's these other ones. That's the problem. And in addition, he's at a school where he constantly feels like he has to, you know, tiptoe through raindrops, basically, like watch everything he says, everything he does. Like it made me sad when he said, you know, he didn't want to go to parties because other people were drinking, not because he was concerned about himself drinking and saying something, but because he was worried about being around some of his classmates when they're drinking and their tongues get loosened and what the heck are they going to say to him, you know? So he, he's in this very, very difficult box already. And then the videos come out, you know, and, and the memories of people like Trayvon Martin, the videos that we already discussed, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and he's connecting his own personal experience with the experiences that he's seeing on social media and just wants to do something, but he has no idea what that is. And then Colin Kaepernick takes a knee and it's like, Eureka, the light bulb goes off. Yes, that's something I can do. And I would argue, you know, Khalil, you, you study social movements and social struggle. This is Colin Kaepernick's great gift to the grand history of social movements. It's that gesture. It's this gesture that you can replicate and do, and everybody knows what it is you're talking about. So as soon as Rodney Axon sees that knee, it clicks with him that he can do that too. So he takes the knee. And when he does, this is when the story in a lot of respects really begins. And that's true for most of these stories is I found when talking to people is like, whoa, the real story is after the knee gets taken. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing like, does the coach support or not, or not support? Do I get stabbed in the back by teammates or stabbed in the front by teammates? Or do I actually get some solidarity and support? Are there teachers who pat me on the back and call me, you know, John Carlos in the hallway? Like, hey, it's John Carlos, you know, or which happened in some cases. Or, did, or are, are there concerns that teachers and particularly professors are actually giving bad grades because they object to what you're doing on the sporting field, which caused one of the people I interviewed, it caused her to transfer out of school because she was absolutely convinced you know, they were trying to push her out through her grades uh, unfairly, which must be a nightmare if you, if you think about what that would be to, 
to have to go through that. And so Rodney then went through all the paces. And what moves me so much about Rodney is two things. One is that despite all the sort of hardship he went through, he has no regrets whatsoever. Like he's very proud of what he did. And then the second thing is when summer of 2020 happens and you have these protests, uh, he felt this sense of vindication about being on the right side of history, which I would argue is one of the most empowering things a person can feel when they feel like I risked something and now that's actually bearing fruit. Yeah, I think that that definitely resonated with me. And I think um, it was really interesting because I was looking up LeBron James recently for some video that I was making. Um, and he was like, obviously similarly from Ohio, he ended up going to a predominantly white school um, for this like better chance. And it's just like, just seeing how that dream is so important for a lot of people who hope to make it in the athletic world and that he risks in a lot of ways giving that up. I think that's like very, very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that you mentioned is how he didn't know exactly what to do to, to like vocalize or perform the rage that he felt after watching or after seeing all of these different cases, but that Colin Kaepernick's gesture gave him a sort of template to follow along with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to transition to a little bit of a different topic, but a lot of times, or at least in, let's say publicly, there was controversy between two celebrities, Colin Kaepernick um, and Jay-Z, uh, who's, I guess, from, from New York, from Brooklyn, I believe, um, on, on, on whether or not that gesture was enough or whether or not that gesture was an impactful thing um, to get communities and people of color and black people specifically to replicate throughout the nation or whether economic power and partnering with the NFL and reforming it through the sort of like push of, of, of ownership um, is a better model. And I'm curious to hear like what you think that is, like what, what is the difference between the Kaepernick effect and like the Sean Carter effect? Like what, are, how do you think about those two things at the same well, time? I mean, I think of the Sean Carter effect as primarily benefiting Sean Carter, while the Kaepernick effect is something that benefits the masses. And anytime someone, I would say this, beware anyone who ever says, protest isn't enough because what we need is actually more protest because we have to understand that ideas for the kind of world we want to live in actually arise out of protest so when people like jay-z say things like the time for kneeling is done and we need to transition out of protest what they're really saying is we need to transition out of struggle and as frederick Douglass said without struggle there is no progress so you know you need that struggle to be the the, the kindling for the fires that will create the kind of change that we want to see. Now, someone likes, people have asked me um, a version of that question where they asked me, do you think uh, Jay-Z sold out? And I wanna be like, no, 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 he didn't sell out at all. But people have to understand he's a billionaire. You know, he's not selling out, he's acting in accordance with his station in society. And what Jay-Z is trying to angle towards is buying the Denver Broncos. And if he wants to do that and become the first black owner of an NFL, more power to him. But what that does for the, the family of George Floyd, I do not know. What that does in communities that deal with police occupation, I do not know. It doesn't do a lot. Meanwhile, what Colin Kaepernick was doing was inspiring people to actually self-actualize themselves as change makers. And that, there's so much more that comes out of that historically and then just saying well we need to have some sort of you know action plan that we go to with to the police because i mean what, what that tends to lead to is a group of of sort of leaders who are siphoned off of the movement and given the responsibility of basically negotiating the terms of people's oppression instead of having people the masses of people come together and, and actually enact change and i think this this confusion about this, it comes, I think, quite quite directly with how, unfortunately, we're so too many people are taught history in this country, like taught that it's a collection of of great men, almost always white men, very very rarely women, who are these exceptional people, and it's almost like they come down from Planet Awesome and create this kind of change, and we're all observers. We're not participants in the fight. We're observers of these great people. And I think that that history, I think it's attractive to people for two reasons. One, we live in a celebrity culture 
And anytime an individual is extolled, it's, it's almost like a, a bees to honey in that regard. But it, it's also because that, that kind of history can be very disempowering and it can be a, a great level of passivity in people. And what was so important about the Kaepernick effect is that it imbues people a sense of action. And action is absolutely critical if we're going to get from point A to point B and have a more just society than the one we currently live in. Like people say, oh, all he did was take a knee. I mean, first of all, that's not all he did. We can have a whole discussion about other stuff that Colin Kaepernick's done. But even if that was all he did, the effect of it means so much more to so many more people than if Jay-Z gets the keys to the castle. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Um, I actually was going to write my thesis, like the former uh, version of it, my senior thesis on Jay-Z um, and his forms of activism, just because I was so curious about like the controversy and like also like his own theories for change. Um, and one thing that it reminded me of, speaking of like metaphors and analogies to older civil rights activists was this sort of conversation um, between W.E.B., I never know how to say it. Oh, Du Bois. Du Bois. Or du Bois, okay, yeah, um, and Booker T. Washington, and like the idea mm -hmm. of just making yourself making the African community um, on Booker T. Washington side like more ac economically advanced, um, improving worth through like ownership and 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 like and those sorts of, of means and that theory of change of like economic power. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Du Bois was more like political power, protecting the right to vote, um, protests, and all of those things. And of course, each of them had nuance and other things I disagree upon. Um, there's like, I think I'm, I'm starting to see that reflected in sort of like this Jay-Z mm -hmm. model where he, he like, let's say in, in some of his albums advocates for small things that individuals can do um, to like save wealth or buy certain things and buy land, which have a lot of holes and issues, especially within the African community, African-American community and discrimination along the lines of class. Um, mm -hmm. And Colin Kaepernick provides like this sort of template for protests and political movements. So that was something that I saw reflected. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If, if there was any other analogies or other ways of segmenting the two strategies that helped you conceptualize the difference between mm. the two. Bri oh, that was brilliantly put. I mean, I, I would, I would say that first and foremost, I mean, Du Bois has been, I think, very strongly pr been proven right by history, um, in in, be in that the Booker T. Washington model of you know put down put down your buckets where you're standing and build where you are. I mean, that can benefit a small minority of people, but it doesn't do anything for the masses of the population. You know, it might segment a small group to actually enjoy the fruits of this system that we live in, but it's not going to do anything. And it's actually going to exacerbate inequality in a country that already suffers from dramatic, dramatic inequality. I mean, we, we need massive, massive anti-poverty programs in the United States. Um, and that's not what Jay-Z represents. You know, we need uh, mass movements against structural racism. And that's not what Jay-Z is trying to build. And I think we can fuse together the movements for political and economic power, as long as we realize that one of the um, walls against achieving true economic power is actually political repression. Like, and I think that that's where Booker T. Washington and his descendants really, really missed it. You know, it's like, how do you expect to um, build black power in the broadest possible sense, not in terms of just a few people, but in the broadest possible sense, as long as politically, I mean, look what's happening right now, whether it's the anti-critical race theory bills or whether it's the voting rights suppressions, the gerrymandering, these, are, these aren't only just political attacks on our political rights, it affects um, people's ability to be economically mobile in society. And so we have to be able to fuse these two things. And I'll say this for, for Colin Kaepernick, you know, I've attended his Know Your Rights camps uh, for young people. And one of the things that's always stressed is this idea of financial literacy. I mean, there, there are sessions that he talks with young people, or he get, actually he gets experts to talk with young people about things like, um, like, like nutritional literacy. You know, I, I'll never forget being in Chicago and, um, there were a couple hundred at youth there, and the question came out, um, how many people here have eaten fast food um, three times in the last week? And just about everybody raises their hands. And the second question, how many of you have someone in your family who 
who's had colon cancer and all so many people raise their hands you know and it's just like like tying together that 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 food um the self-determination of even the food we eat is something that's a political fight and of course it's also an economic fight because you have to be able to afford to not just eat fast food. That's also an economic question in addition to being a political question. So, I mean, I, I think the fusing of these two issues is critical for any sort of liberation politics. Yeah, um, I'll lose my last throwback, but it's interesting you said like in Chicago, there are these nutritional literacy programs because I believe that's one of the places where they had the Black Panther breakfast program yes. and also one of the places where the police raided the Black Panther breakfast program. Um, and I believe, actually, I have a TikTok on this, but they they urinated on the food that was meant for the children after raiding it, which is completely insane. But mm -hmm. at least it goes to show that these things um, are resistant throughout time and there's an mm -hmm. ability for them to, to come back. Um, but I that's think, so important. yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let you react to that. No, no, that that's so powerful. And the, the, the Panthers um, hold up this example that's really important that shows that if you're just trying to build your economic base without a political fight, the police are still gonna come in. I mean, any challenge to racist, structural racism, I mean, it's going to be a, a, a very intense battle uh, regardless. So it's like having an economic fight and having a political fight in a lot of ways, the le that's the legacy the Panthers have, have given us is that you need to be able to have ways in which you can build up the community and you need to have ways in which you, you know, directly challenge inequality and capitalism um, or you're going to end up um, in a situation that's going to, you know, lead to the decimation of not just the struggle, but entire communities. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, and I'll say, like, we've done a lot of going into the past, but I'd love to talk about, like, present day slash future as it relates at least to the book. So as I was reading it, it was like there are parts of the book that, especially like in the, the, the beginning and the forwards and the intro, intros, um, that talk about things that felt like they literally happened yesterday um mm. and it feels so timely like i can't believe this was published and printed and sent to me um and there's like in that that time span because like it feels like a lot of the george floyd references and a lot of the other things that have happened since um are so timely and so my question for you is like in writing this because it's a story that it's not over like the kaepernick effect is still affecting people you said there was a story that came out to you already mm -hmm. that i guess can't be in the book because the book is already right. out but how do you know, or how did you know when to like wrap it up or when the story was complete or how'd you go about it even if that's, if that's a feeling that you felt at all? Ah, uh, that, that, that's the, the, the ultimate question. I, I, I call that the, the, the painter's question. Like when do you take a step back away from the portrait? You know, how do you know that last brush stroke is done? And also the incredible fear that comes with knowing that once you put the brush down, it doesn't belong to you anymore. You know, that, that's that, that moment. And I, I've, you know, written, other books and that moment where you hit return and you send it into your editor or you send it into your publisher and you know that your, your baby is no longer yours you know and, and there other other hands are going to shape it you know almost always for the better but still it, it'll no longer be what what you put together i mean you you ask a terrific question and like because this is ongoing and we're going to see more protests in the years to come um but to me, the summer of 2020 was such an important moment in history, in the history for racial justice, in the history of protest, in the history of struggle. I mean, my goodness, protests in all 50 states, that never happened during the civil rights movement, you know, in the same concentrated period of time. You know, the idea that this country, which we're told all the time, is you know irredeemably uh divided i mean the idea red state blue state which i think is such a false division i mean the idea that we had protests in idaho and protests in san francisco around the same issue about the same man who was killed in minneapolis it, it obviously that speaks to that people are upset in ways that far transcend what occurred to George Floyd and not and not even the other viral videos or anything like that, but they saw a reflection of their own lived experience in what happened to George Floyd. That's the only reason why there would ever be protests that large and that intense. And so to me, after, in the aftermath of those protests and also thinking about, okay, if we can get this book out and I appreciate the new press for doing this, 
Um, if we can get the book out in fall of 2021, fifth anniversary of when Colin Kaepernick first sat during the anthem, start of the NFL season, why not? You know, that's a good point by which to at least start this discussion while being extremely humble about the fact that this story is an ongoing story. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's so important because it is a present day story. And you, you and I, are, we, we, we share being uh, history majors and having that, um, like having that sense of what's happened in the past, but it's like the, the past becomes, uh, becomes dry and desiccated if we're not applying it to the present and using it as a way to understand the future. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, thank you so much. We're gonna transition now into the audience. Already? And yeah, it's, it's about that time. I'm gonna start selecting a few um, that I think are, are really good for us to answer. So I'll start with, I think a really good one to kick things off. It says, how did Dave's social, political and cultural views and their intersection with sports come about? How is this combination received within the sports world? Does anyone else do what you do? Uh, that's a very kind question. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I, I was your age, Khalil, and there was a, a basketball player for uh, the Denver Nuggets named Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. He makes the decision uh, to not stand during the national anthem. He was asked why. And he said, well, that flag may be a symbol of freedom and democracy to some, but it's a symbol of oppression and tyranny to others. And me, I was somebody who lived life on two parallel tracks. I was very much into history. I was into all the stuff that, that you're into, Khalil, in terms of like the history of social protest and how it changed the world. And, I was, and, and people's just, so the self-actualization of, of the individual mm -hmm. was something that I was just very into, the self-emancipation of the individual. And... I was also really into sports, just, you know, obsessed. But to me, being into sports meant knowing all the statistics on the back of a baseball card. It didn't mean this history of people like Muhammad Ali, Billy Jean King, Tommy Smith, John Carlos. And I'll never forget um, on ESPN, one of the talking heads after Mahmoud Abdul Rauf refused uh, to come out for the anthem, they said, oh, he must see himself in the tradition of those activist athletes. And my head just like exploded, like, like what's an activist athlete? I didn't even know what that was. So I went to um, the library. I also started uh, reading the book. My roommate was in a class called uh, The History of the Black Athlete, taught by Professor Mahmoud uh, El Kati. Mm -hmm. And I just saw uh, the professor yesterday when I was in Minneapolis, because that's where I went to college. I was speaking at my school. And I'll never forget, I, I, I just gotta say that like Mahmoud El Kati, he's 87 years old, sharp as attack, he was at the event. And, and you know, he, he said to me, hey, I, I love the work you're doing. And I said, well, your class changed my life. And he looked at me and he said, well, you didn't take my class. And I couldn't believe he remembered that. And I said, yeah, I didn't take your class, but my roommate did, and I read all his books. <laughs> and, and I like would sneak into your class and sit in the back. And he, he was like, so, pleased to hear that. And I, I just, Professor El Kati is just in my heart a, a, as I do all of this work. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it. Um, are there other people in sports doing this? Yeah, there, there's a new generation of sports writers who are looking at this in a more political view. There's been a profound change over the last five, 10 years in terms of the kinds of sports writing jobs that exist. Uh, young people who don't want to just write about balls and strikes, but actually want to write about the socio-political context in which sports take place. There are now dedicated positions to being sports, culture, and politics writers at places like the Washington Post, USA Today, and a host of other papers. Uh, obviously, the blogosphere has opened itself up for that. So, you know, I started doing this almost 20 years ago, and I just got to tell you, the landscape is profoundly different than when I started. Got it. Um, that's great. That, like, thank you for sharing that. That's very inspiring. I mean, if you could um, we'll probably try to, if you would type your professor's name or any of the book recommendations for the audience, that would be um, great. Sure. In the meantime, I'm going to get another um, question. And you can just feel free, I guess, like just write the name and the panelists and attendees. Are you able to find that? Yeah, I'm just going to write Mahmoud El Kati. Perfect, perfect. Yes, Honor it. Just want to share that. Make sure the audience, I just want to make sure the audience has that if they want to do any further research. Um, and I will be doing further research. 
it was great to see him on campus. One of the terrific professors um, at my alma mater, which is McAllister mm -hmm. College, just calls him Elder Mahmoud. <laughs> great to see you, Elder Mahmoud. And he was wearing a, a face mask that said good trouble on it. It was, it was awesome. Um, okay, I'm going to ask another question. So the recent addition of the Black National Anthem at the opening of NFL games has garnered support and complaints from people from many backgrounds and viewpoints. Um, what do you think was the league's true motivation for the anthem's addition, and how do you think this move has been received by the players and fans? Do you think this change will last? Yeah, I mean, this is that's a great question. This is all about carrot and stick. Um, you know, the NFL realizes that what Colin Kaepernick did was, I mean, he he opened up you know the the bottle of wine and poured it out all over the place, and you can't put the wine back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. You know, the genie is out of the lamp in terms of players protesting in the NFL had to adjust and figure out how to deal with the fact that their entire league rests on a profound uh, contradiction, is that you don't have the NFL without a deep, deep sense of racial and labor discipline. That has to be maintained to have a National Football League. How else can you have a league that has uh, no black franchise owners, but 70% of the players are black, and it's got a 100% injury rate? You know, and contracts are not guaranteed and the typical career is only three years. That is a very rough set of material circumstances and it's a very rough objective reality. And it depends on this degree of vertical authoritarianism and making sure that everybody knows their place and everybody does what they're supposed to do. And here's Colin Kaepernick living the famous Muhammad Ali quote who said, you know, I don't have to be what you want me to be. And that there's a danger in that. That's why I said when we first started the conversation that you know this is about more than police violence and racial inequity. This is about you know who is supposed to lead and who is supposed to follow. And Colin Kaepernick and others turning that on its head. And I view the playing of the Black National Anthem. I view the fact that they put things like you know slogans like "End Racism" in the end zone or allow players to wear decals on their helmets or start a social justice committee inside the NFL as their effort to corral what the, the new consciousness that's taking place and make sure that it's expressed through acceptable parameters that they can still control. Because that's what it's really all about at the end of the day. It's about control. Great answer. Um, so someone also asked, is this being recorded? Do we get a copy of it? Yes, um, it's being live streamed on Facebook and there will be a recording that comes out afterwards as well. Um, and there's really, there's one more question that we'll, we'll do um, that is really interesting to me. So it says, you talked about Mexico um, in 68 as like the start of the modern era of protests in sports. Are there any earlier significant protests in the sports world? Absolutely. Th this is uh, why I love sports history, because it's such an incredible lens to which to understand American history. Uh, sp politics are baked into the cake of organized sports in this country, and this goes back to the 19th century. There have always been political rebels in sports, uh, dating back to the 1800s. And the reason why is because sports rests on this huge contradiction. It's the myth of inclusion and the reality of exclusion. Because when sports start in the 19th century, it's held up as being this incredible symbol of the United States, of a true meritocracy. Anyone who, who can, who's good at the sport can make it on the field. Anybody who tries hard enough is going to get in the game. You know, it's a, a huge like effort at ideological reproduction. Like the ideas of this country are reflected through sports to teach a young generation, particularly at that time, a young generation of European immigrants that, you know, you're no longer Polish or Irish or whatever, Italian, you're American now, really you're white, but you're American now. And you can facilitate that through sports, through this great meritocracy. So, but that's, but that inclusion narrative was a myth because the reality was exclusion, women not allowed to play. Uh, black and brown folks go off to the side and make your own leagues if you want to, but you know we don't want to see it, we don't want to hear about it, and we're not going to fund it. You know, so the whole history of sports has been this fight for inclusion, this fight for a level playing field, this fight by marginalized groups to be heard and to find expression of their own lives in the sports world. And in that regard, sports has always been this expression we used earlier, this canary in the coal mine because usually struggles erupt in sports around this fight for inclusion that then break out in the broader society. You know, that's why 
when we talk about the civil rights movement, we also talk about Jackie Robinson, who comes into the league uh, almost a full decade before the start of the civil rights movement. I mean, he comes into Major League Baseball while Dr. King is still a student at Boston University, for goodness sakes. You know, so, and, or Muhammad Ali coming out against the Vietnam War when very few people in the country were against the Vietnam War. You see these things reflected in sports in a very powerful manner, and it can be an incredibly effective lens for teaching about the contradictions of the United States. Got it. Well, thank you so much. Um, those are all the questions we can take. I am going to pass it back to Marsha now. Oh, b b before you go, Marsha, I just have to say, Khalil, that was fantastic. <laughs> I've done so many of these at this point, and I enjoyed doing this with you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Of course, I had a great time too. Thank you for taking the time to be here and thank you for writing the book. It was amazing. I definitely recommend everyone get it from the local store or the link that's been provided. It's a great read. Next time you're in Maryland, we'll go to Ben's Chili Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Wow, and I just wanna thank you both. I mean, what a wide ranging, connecting the dots, mind blowing set of things you were able to talk about in one short hour. Um, and I wanna thank you. And I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight. As Khalil said, the program was recorded, is recorded, and we're gonna post it tomorrow on the Center for Brooklyn History's YouTube channel. Um, I think there'll be a link that goes into the chat if you want that. Uh, and I really hope that you'll explore the other programs offered by the Center for Brooklyn History and the BPL Presents team. We have lots of, of, of discussions coming up that I think will be interesting to you. Next week, for instance, we'll be talking about the land back movement with four First Nations leaders from across the country. And then um, uh, in connection with the Brooklyn Resists initiative I mentioned earlier, later this month we have the first in a three part series and this is so pertinent to the conversation we just heard that's called Black Protest, Black Art. This series will bring artists, writers, musicians together to talk about the expressions, uh, expression of resistance through their work. People like Dred Scott, photographer Ruddy Roy, musician Jamila Woods, writer Morgan Jerkins, um, please join us for those programs. They start uh, later this month. Uh, so again, Dave, Khalil, 